For us, we're kind of old school distributors in the sense that we don't set the market, the market sets the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, true. So it's our job to go out, it's our job to find the right suppliers and convey their message to the end user yeah. and then bring real feedback from the market back to the supply. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, CEO of Beverage Trade Network and your host of Inside the Drinks Business. We are standing right now in Maverick Wine Company, which is a wine importer and wholesaler out of Chicago. I'm meeting Ian and discussing about the business of wholesale. This is a very different, interesting episode, so continue watching and this will help you pitch them better and how to work with them better, especially for other wholesalers as well on how they operate because they're a very nice wine company based out of Chicago, so you're going to learn a lot. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, your host, CEO of Beverage Trade Network, and we are doing inside the drinks business from a wholesaler point of view. And we are right now sitting in a wine wholesaler, a medium-sized wholesaler called Maverick Wine Company, and I'm here with Ian. Ian's a wine director and wine portfolio manager you know, of this wholesale operation, and we're gonna really deep dive into the business of wholesale and how portfolio is managed, how wine items are picked, how they are discontinued, and so on. Ian, thanks for having me here. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. Super, so I think, uh, you know, uh, let's just give a quick, quick introduction about your journey. You know, just tell us about your title, exactly what you do, and how did you end up in this role? Sure, uh, I'm the portfolio manager for Maverick Wine Company. Um, I, like most people in the wine business, came about this in a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know, wake up when I was 10 years old saying I want to be in the wine business. Yeah. Uh, brought me to Chicago for university um, and through working in uh, nicer restaurants around Chicago, caught the wine bug like a lot of people do. Um, finished university with my degree, did what I thought I was going to do for six months and said this is not for me at all. That was so much more fun. How do I make that a career. Mm -hmm. um, so you did a bit of a serving jobs as well? Exactly. Okay. So um, I, I got lucky. I happened to walk in. Uh, I was brand new to Chicago. I was 21 years old and uh, was hired on the wine team at a famous restaurant, Spiaggia, that's no longer yeah. in business anymore. Um, uh, and got to work under some legendary uh, Chicago wine people, Henry Bishop, Stephen Alexander. Um, and so then after graduating and saying like, okay, this is really where I want to take my life. Mm -hmm. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. um, pursuing a sommelier certification first was the, was the natural progression. I moved around a little bit, uh, working for different restaurant groups around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but originally the Midwest is my home, so wanted to be back here um, and got an opportunity from uh, a, another company. Uh, Winebow has worked for Winebow for about five years. Yep. And then I've been with Maverick now for just over six. Hi everybody, welcome to Maverick Wine Company. Uh, today we're taking a trip through a wholesaler in Chicago. Follow me. Let's go. So this is the uh, office registry, I mean the well, entry. Exactly, yeah, we're still uh, partially uh, partially working remotely, so this would be where our customer service uh, people usually sit, they're not, not here today. And this is also for payment collections, and these are the same people who exactly. call retailers? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got it. I, I, I had a wholesale business, by the way, that's why in Delaware. Ah, perfect, cool. What's that, like? Uh, some uh, of this is a number, uh, one of our portfolio manager's offices here. Okay. Uh, as we uh, take a stroll over here. Uh, our purchasing manager, uh, Mr. Arminetti. Purchase uh, orders go from yeah, here. And compliance and, uh, and AR is over here. And now, you know, your core job is to uh, manage your book, right? Uh, correct, yeah. So I mean, give us a breakdown of like how many items, you know, how many pages, sort of, you know, what, what kind of uh, SKU count are you managing? Uh, we're fairly ambitious at Maverick. Uh, we have about this year in 2022, we'll sell about 4,000 unique items. Wow. Uh, that's not uh, saying, oh, I had sold 2019 and 2020 of the same wine. Uh, that's unique items. Um, okay. So uh, we have a very, very large book, probably the largest in the market. Wow. Um, so our go-to-market strategy may be a little different than either a very big liquor company or a very small um, very small company. Uh, generally, the portfolio we're trying to represent uh, family companies from around the world though. Uh, is a very broad stroke of it. And you guys import or it's just distribution? Uh, import and distribution as well. All right. Uh, what's the percentage of import in the portfolio versus just uh, you know, uh, picking up from an importer? Uh, we're a pretty heavy, uh, pretty heavy imports company, whether that's working through a third party importer mm -hmm. or things that carry a Maverick back label that we import ourselves. Um, 
if we were looking at our, let's say our top 50, uh, 50 suppliers, probably 60% of that would be, uh, would be more imports uh, than domestic. Got it, super. We like Hello. that we're uh, connected right to the warehouse. I've uh, been in places where we're not. Super. Uh, is there any way uh, you've uh, stacked up? Uh, is this part of your uh, or operations is it different? You know, how are you planning your pallets, which SKUs go where? Uh, these guys are uh, best in the business. I mean, we don't even, uh, usually in two bins next to each other, you won't, uh, you won't even have a like producer. Oftentimes they won't even put cases that are the same color next to each other to avoid mispicks mm. um, or, or any confusion. So um, it's very important to us to differentiate what's in each in each location mm -hmm. uh, to, av to avoid that later because it just makes headaches for everyone and allows us to give better service uh, if we get it right the first time. Got it. And is this like a stack with like fast movings are down and then a little bit less and then the slow movers are up? Exactly, yeah. So basically as we, as we would go through the warehouse, our fast movers are here are okay. at the front. On the floor. Near, on the floor near the door. Got it. Um, and then as we go up and back, things that are uh, slower. So movers. if you're a supplier and you're coming to your, you know, to see your stuff and if it's lying down there, something's, you know, behind the scene without asking him, you know, it's it's not moving. And if, you, if it's here, it's good. Yes, sir. All right. I think uh, let's start with the science of portfolio design, right? Sure. Uh, what, what comes to mind when, if there was a new company, absolutely new company we're starting, you know, let's say we're partnering, let's start a wholesale business, and the, you know, you, you're in charge of designing the book. You know, what comes to the, the first 10 questions, five questions, how do you think we should do that? Boy, that's a good question. Um, aligning yourselves with, um, for us, it's uh, aligning ourselves with importers. Uh, we still, while we do import our own wine, we believe in importers. Uh, okay. We believe in larger, uh, larger import portfolios that have uh, generational legacy. Okay. A lot of times, uh, like those, Palm Bay or exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, a lot of times, those portfolios are large enough that they could necessitate more than one wholesaler in a given market. True. Um, so, for a smaller upstart company trying to find somebody who uh, who maybe only has eighty percent of their portfolio represented here, where you can get uh, support of a larger company, um, rather than just trying to cobble together a bunch of things that Understood. no one has. So, you, ever you seen go before. with lesser supplier and which has more thicker books uh, from your, as far as your supplier goes you, you prefer that an importer a bigger importer is better than a small boutique importer because it's um, it, 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 it's both actually so okay. I, I guess looking at versus starting a new company versus Mavericks portfolio all right um, I guess looking at Mavericks portfolio within any category uh, we want to have a classic producer a progressive producer and make sure that everything's inclusive. And by inclusive, I don't always just mean uh, diversity or of, of course we want more women winemakers, we want more people of color in our portfolio, of course we want that. But that we're also portraying that to the end user as well, that we're making, that we're not running a wine museum and that we're making sure that we're opening uh, opening bottles that have maybe become too precious mm. um, and have been allocated and oh, this thing hasn't been opened in 10 years, so a young sommelier might not know mm -hmm. what this wine even is, even though they've read about mm -hmm. it. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we take the approach to the portfolio. We always want something classic and something progressive and up and coming in any area. And what's classic, meaning like uh, the, the varietal and it's like, you know, uh, the brand name or the varietal is classic? Um, more the brand name in the okay. area. So w which, whichever producer is in that area, you know, if we're talking about uh, coat. So for example, let's say uh, this is a classic, right? It, it Ridge all, the all classic, Protatorio yeah. del Barbaresco. These, these are classics. Um, and so then within that, um, those are the bigger brands, more well-known names. We also want something for the the up-and-coming, uh, either progressive restaurants mm -hmm. or independent thinking bottle shops, um, who who want to work with something a little smaller and a little more hands-on, where there might be a more direct relationship. Even and with progressive the is what where supplier is aggressively pushing and want to grow brand, or how do you define progressive? Uh, for us, we just define it as uh, as up-and-coming. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the brand name. The brand name. Exactly. So it's growing fast. It has some data. You know, uh, it's showing someone has proven you and shown you that, okay, we've grown in a couple of states fast, and I think it's, 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 it would be great if you can distribute in Illinois. Exactly. And, and at that same time, there's a certain amount of just gut feel, and we're still romantics. We, we take okay. romantic chances on things if we say, you know, we, uh, boy, I'm thinking of Protatory now. We, we love this new Barbaresco producer. Right. Um, they maybe haven't been in the U.S. before, but we've tried the wines several vintages in a row. They really over-deliver for the price, the quality. I understand. And, and the, they're farming right, whatever whatever metric we're checking for that specific producer, yep. 
um, we certainly take chances as well that don't necessarily have to rely on hard data. Okay. So I think first macro category is this three, and then how do you, how do you break it up? Like, is that by price, by regions, by country? Exactly. I mean, yeah, by price, by region, but really all of those ways. And okay. then we'll then we'll look at it from the opposite side and say, okay, we looked at, we looked at price and region. Now let's look at regional opportunity maybe surrounding there. Like uh, I've used Cote de Rhone, I think, as, as a reference. So uh, maybe we're over full in Cote de Rhone, but we need another Chateau Neuf de Pop um, mm. if from the same area because we don't have that price point mm. uh, covered at this point. So uh, just a little bit of context, like I sold, I had my own brands as well. So what I used to do, I remember, is I used to see the portfolio of a wholesaler. And if there was, uh, let's say, New Zealand wine and there was just no Australian wine, and there were some other imports like Spain and other 10 countries, I used to pitch that, hey, I can be your Australian supplier. That's one way I approached a wholesaler by analyzing their portfolio. The mm -hmm. second was maybe if there was already an Australian uh, producer, which was like $14 retail wine they had, but mine was $7.99 and Yellowtail was hot that time. So maybe you need something like me, you know? Exactly. Uh, so how do you uh, advise any tips you have that someone purely goes to your website right now yeah. and knows that, okay, I have a higher chance because I see a gap here. For us in our portfolio, we're looking for um, authentic things made from a place by people. So uh, there so are no gaps, basically, so as far as the there. checkbox goes, it's all, you're covering the entire sort of things, at, right? At this point, we are. So, um, okay. So I, I think maybe it, it might make sense to talk more about Got it. shopping in general with a wholesaler. Um, to your point, looking at what categories are left unfilled, uh, specifically then if you're coming with data as to how you can better fill that hole, Got right? It. Saying you have a lot of fourteen ninety nine New Zealand wine, but I notice you have no nine ninety nine Australian wine, um, and here's why that category is important and why you should be present in that space. I'm not sure. We'll go back on that supplier thing, but I want to stick to that portfolio. Uh, are there you know any limitations given to you? Like okay. 10,000 SKUs or whatever, 4,000 uh, items is the max EN you need to play with. Like some item has to go out before you add anything, like you know how the retail shelf usually thinks. Uh, yeah, so we, we definitely operate in a, a first in, first out uh, capacity. Okay. Some of the things we work with are quite small and, and limited where I might um, only be picking up from a winery once a year. In that case, there's not the enormous sense of urgency to turn that inventory quite as quickly because once it's gone, it's gone and mm -hmm. there's just not more. Okay. Uh, we operate a lot in that space where we're generally selling, like I said, finite things made by people from a place. Mm. Um, if we're talking about um, brands more, that would be where we get into more looking at metrics and how we're, uh, where trends are going up or down, mm. seasonality of things, um, but one-offs that are small vintage things, which is probably why our portfolio is quite large because we deal in a lot of a lot finite, of a lot of finite items, yeah. Like fine wine, exactly. Yeah. Uh, back on the KPI, right? Uh, what are your exact KPIs? Meaning, what are you responsible for for your job? Let's say if you if the, we were doing a performance review and your your manager was just, you know, making sure that you sent that report and you're performing on your KPIs. Mm -hmm. What are those like five or six things? In portfolio management, um, the finish line is always just in front of you. Um, no matter, you might have just done something great, but then there's always the next. Thing is always just there's in not, front of you. Basically, you mean like there's always the next hot brand which you're trying to get? Is that or, what you mean? Or? That or just uh, general responsibilities. Usually, uh, our, a, a well put together portfolio should be like like a mutual fund, right? Not an individual stock. Ah, so it, you got it. It's a work in progress. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. It's, per, it's a perpetual work in progress. So True. whenever we uh, do something great for one of our suppliers, then it's time to do something great for the next one. True. Um, and you could say that for our customers as well. Yep. Um, so there's always the next step. Uh, but in terms of KPI and just what what a day looks like, ordering and controlling inventory, uh, making those portfolio decisions, uh, making sure things are uh, priced correctly, uh, making sure your staff is educated, um, of course. So I sort of, I get this question a lot from sommeliers trying to come to the wholesaler importer side of the business, and I view it quite similarly uh, in terms of responsibility of mm -hmm. running a very large program, either retail or restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, it's just that on a larger scale, right? You're managing inventory, you're making sure your staff's educated, you're putting on meaningful events that people mm -hmm. want to attend. Um, uh, really all of that. Got it. So it's similar, like your, your, your main uh, way to uh, track the portfolio is what? Depletion, profit margins, top line sales? Depletions, profit margin, top line sales. Um, uh, we certainly look at it. Illinois is a very seasonal market. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we sell 
a ton of rosé in the summer and we sell no rosé in the winter, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So uh, looking at the seasonality of trends mm -hmm. uh, matters here okay. uh, more than some other markets, but, um, but yeah. So how's, how's the uh, holiday plan? You know, what, what do you do usually when it comes to the holiday season? Any tweaks you do? Any kickoff, any motivational things for sales meetings? Oh, sure. Uh, so we actually just had our big, um, our big OND kickoff meeting uh, where we actually don't allow suppliers in that one. Usually we love suppliers in our meeting, but in this one we just said, okay, let's get the team together. What it's is about, OND? It's about, uh, October, November, All December, right. the busy season when, 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 when we, everybody it. gets into the black. Got it. Um, so uh, we love suppliers in our meeting, but in this case we said, you know what team, let's get together yeah. as a crew. Let's plan This one's perfect. just gonna be just us and say, here's our priorities for the season um, and what we're gonna go after. So we had a great meeting. We actually did it offsite. We took everyone uh, for nice. a round of bowling afterwards. And priority <laughs> meaning you, you, you tell them these are the items we're gonna go aggressively with. Exactly, and maybe, um, Chicago is such a seasonal market because we're in the upper Midwest, so we're saying, okay, we've all been selling a bunch of rosé mm -hmm. and canned cocktails and all the, all the things that we know we sell a ton mm -hmm. of in the summer. We all need to be thinking about our business differently mm -hmm. and getting into the big Cabernet Barolo mm -hmm. uh, mindset for uh, what we're going into now. And how much is a uh, lot of like, you know, maybe some brands you're just, you're keeping for reputation mm -hmm. and not, you know, uh, so give us some other things which come in portfolio design which plays, you know, uh, not a black and white role. Sure. Well, something we're pretty excited about now, I mean, the, the non-alcoholic space okay. is certainly growing um, uh, very, very quickly. Um, and it's something that there's not a lot of data on mm -hmm. yet. So it is, uh, that is a little more of gut feel and, uh, and who you want to work with to be your partners in that space. Uh, it's exciting for us to be in a, in a new space mm -hmm. like that right now because we're just, we're in the middle of it so we can't, can't see the whole field yet, mm -hmm. um, but it's exciting to see it, it see a new development uh, coming out of the market right now. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on that portfolio, uh, how are you measuring your like non-performing items, uh, and what do you do mainly? You know, what's interesting is okay, you know that this is a slow mover now, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you approach the supplier or the retailer or your sales reps? What are the things first you're going to try, and then you know the whole process of maybe uh, that brand gets another chance or never, you know. Um, yeah, uh, Illinois is a, I mean, every market is challenging to do business in. Illinois is an especially challenging market to do business in. Um, generally, if a, a large number needs to be made for a large company nationally, uh, it can happen here because we don't have price posting like there is in New York okay. or some other places. Nice. Other markets so you can do deals here? You can do deals. Okay. They do have to be published uh, for the market. Which means everyone needs to get that deal if Correct. they want. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, but you can do that. Understood. Um, so like three on 10, whatever, exactly. five on 25. Yeah, so um, we generally don't uh, have a supplier base that can afford that to cut that deep, let's say. Uh -huh. We don't want, we can never lose money on something more than twice. Um, so we'll take... Uh -huh. uh, so you're going to try once, but you will not give a chance to a brand again with your own sort of cost. We, we would we would take a chance on something two times. I would if, okay. if I if let's say we and what does that mean? Like uh, you're going to tell your sales team that hey, take this wine this Monday this week. Mm -hmm. Let's try and then everyone saying oh yeah, this did not work. People yeah. did not buy. Then you're going to ask one more time, one more week, guys. Let's try, and um, then it's sort of done, right? I would, no, I would say more in general. If it was that, if it was that stark, if we if we gave a mandate to the whole sales team and said everybody take this product out mm -hmm. this week and and it came back nothing. Yeah. And then we said, do it again next week. Boy, we really, we, we screwed up on, on my side because I, sh I should have never signed that up because True. Uh, for us, we're kind of old school distributors in the sense that we don't set the market. The market sets the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, True. So it's our job to go out. It's our job to find the right suppliers and convey their message to the end user yeah. and then bring real feedback from the market back to the supplier. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I like our that. job's done well, that's it. Yeah, how are you listening to that? You know, while well, you tell your sales rep, you know, are like rumors, right? Like they're yeah. all, oh, this, this thing is moving. So is that one, like, how are you taking your notes from the market? Generally, when there's a big launch or uh, any kind of producer visit or anything, we have very, uh, very detailed recaps. All of the sales, uh, all of the sales team has a weekly plan that they follow and say, here's what I'm showing Monday, here's what I'm doing Tuesday, I have this event Wednesday. Um, and, and lays out their week. So we can always reference back to it yeah. um, to say, oh, we saw a spike in this Zinfandel producer in August of last year. What was going on in August of last year? So we look back and say, oh, we had, um, the winemaker was in town that week, so that's mm -hmm. why we sold 50 extra cases mm -hmm. this particular week. Mm -hmm. um, I think going back to your question on what to do when something's not working, though, was, was the, was the yeah. real question. Um, 
And, and there are several things. One is, you know, we have to look look in the mirror. Did was was this being sampled properly? Was it, who was it shown to? Was it shown to the right people? Um, Illinois, the mar way the market is structured here, there's a few. We have Chain Grocery, which sells uh, which sells quite a bit. We have a, a large retail customer, Binnie's, and then a, and then a very vibrant independent market. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at uh, which channel something might live. Um, you know, was this presented to somebody who should have seen it? Was it presented to somebody who shouldn't have seen I understood. it? Understood. Um, you know, did I, did my sales rep bring a bottle of wine that cost eight dollars to a three-star Michelin restaurant? That was probably a mistake if they did, unless they asked for that for some reason. Yeah. So making sure we sold the right thing to the right customer, um, we received that feedback from the market. Then we can come back to the supplier and say, usually it's a, a, a price to quality ratio. Yeah thing of saying, oh, I, I'm getting, I keep using Cote running, I'm getting this Prosecco from hmm. uh, somebody else Honestly, and the, the yeah. Prosecco I'm getting, I'm paying $8 for, mm -hmm. uh, the one you're bringing me is 10, I like it, but this mm -hmm. is Prosecco and for this section of my business, it's all about the value for me. Mm -hmm. Now I might find another customer who says, I care more about the quality in this, in this category mm -hmm. for me. Um, so it's maintaining uh, a close relationship with our customers and their needs. Um, that ultimately drives what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Got it. Let's talk about sales management a little bit because I think ultimately we're in the sales business. You sure. Know, reps and sales, right? Sure. Uh, you know, you have a sales manager? Yes. All right. So uh, what's the biggest challenge, which is usually for the small guys is that catch 22 where they don't have a brand like you know, you guys, a popular brand which retailers want. Yeah. And they are trying to get that brand, but a, a big brand only comes when you're a big wholesaler. Sure. Right? Uh, so till that, till that moment, you, you either die or, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, what's your tip on recruitment of salespeople when they don't have a brand, a good brand to sell? Um, you usually have to have some other point of differentiation, uh, a, a good account run. Um, okay. We'll do that. Um, if you have an established account run that uh, usually fits a small upstart company, the owner would have been doing a lot of things themselves and at some point you have to pass off those those customers, right? Uh, you can't continue to be owning the company, calling on 100 accounts, yep. and, 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 and. Um, so finding those, those opportunities to get a nice veteran salesperson on your team, mm -hmm. or on the flip side, a person who's never done it before, um, working with working with them. What, what's your interview questions you guys ask to a new salesperson? One of the things we like to ask is, um, you know, I like to, I like to ask, uh, especially if there's somebody from uh, a, a, a sommelier or something coming who wants to get into this side of the business, I'd love to ask to uh, sell me something you don't like. Um, sell me sell me a wine that you're not fired up about. It's easy to sell something you love, yeah. um, but sell me something. Uh, tell me that that big brand of Pinot Noir that I've heard you make fun of five times. Pretend yeah. pretend that landed in our in our warehouse. Yeah. How would you sell that now? Like sell me Gallo. Exactly. Exactly. So exactly. Yeah, Zinfandel. You, you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, market's a market, right? Exactly. If, if it's if people want that, and that's that's where the thing is. On that KPI I think, uh, are you responsible for inventory on hand? Because it looks like it's connected somehow. Yes. That's the ultimate way. You know, sort of, you play the game with what you have, right? Very much, yeah. I mean, we there uh, we work out of a finite space, okay. so we, we only have so much room. Um, so if more couple of more pallets are stacking up, that means E ends on pressure, right? Like Ex exactly. Something's yeah. not going right. So, yeah. uh, what like like that? Like, how do you how do you evaluate the performance? You know, of, of your book. It would be by uh, really by. Um, by item and by supplier, really. Uh, is there like, let's say, is there like from your office staff, do you get like a report which clearly says uh, August, uh, whatever, 4,000 cases sold, top sales, uh, 1 million, and gross profit, 200,000. Is that the ultimate way you'll see that, okay, my months are moving better? Yes, and then we'll look at, um, we'll look at trends within that too. Um, so saying the July, August, September, we expected to be growing at this rate and we grew at this rate, or we grew at this rate. Um, and looking at what those are, I mean, that could be things as- uh, Like you said, like winemaker came a, a or- Winemaker came, uh, the tasting menu restaurant changed their menu and now we have a Sauvignon Blanc uh -huh. uh, on a pairing that we didn't have three months ago and uh -huh. they're now they're taking five cases a week because it's part of a pairing menu. Okay. Um, on, on the other side of that, oh, the dish changed at this tasting menu restaurant, and now we don't have that. Yeah. Um, so now, now what do we do with with that? And so what I'm generally looking for, um, again, unless it's something really finite that we only get once a year, I can always order more to move up into a trend. What we want to keep an eye on because we have such a large portfolio is keeping an eye on our tail, uh, and that that, that that doesn't get too long. That our inventory mm. inventory tail is not too long because if I'm going to sell. 4,000 unique items in a year, right? I've got to make sure that those are turning over. Yeah. Um, and if suddenly I, you know, I blink, 
five percent of four thousand is eight hundred items. So that you know, I could, yeah. it could get yeah get squirrely pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially in wine, like where vintages yeah. are also in the equation, not like spirits, where you you know time is not a pressure. Yeah. Uh, let's go on the fun stuff. Where you know one of the challenges we all face now is there is Southern in R and D C's of the world, and then there are one truck distributors, and it's so f hard to find companies like you, which are a great fit for the suppliers, mm. you know, like Johnson's and like like a perfect fit. Uh, but there are hardly like fifty. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of. Uh, how? What's the best approach you would tell? A foreign, let's say an Australian company or Italian winery to reach out to you because you know I, I know that cold calling is something which you all this must be getting like LinkedIn or email marketing but sure. any particular hacks you would give them like okay write this in an email and that will uh, increase the open rate ratio. One of the things I would say for anybody uh working internationally trying to start doing business in the US market is uh, holding some version of inventory in the US mm -hmm. uh, is is I don't want to say it's paramount because we certainly work with people who don't. But if you were trying to get a foothold in this market, so use MHW Park Street model. At least get started. Have a couple of uh, a container invest in carriers or something. Have something. have a pickup uh, um, location of US and give a convenience of a pallet at least. Exactly because okay. you, you can certainly have an upcharge for that because it costs money to warehouse wine here. It's not like it's free. Got it. And you can say we work on a, a direct yeah. import model only. But if I mean, it's no secret that international logistics has been an absolute mess for the last two years. Yeah. It's sort of getting better. It's not really getting better. It's yes. sort of getting better. Um, so especially if you're saying I'm a young upstart company, if you're not in a young upstart, if you're an established company in Europe mm -hmm. and want to start doing business in America, and especially if you're looking at working with a, a very small company, like you said, a one or two truck company, we have to think about what, what is their overhead? How are they going to be able to, can they buy a container worth of this wine? Probably mm, not, not yeah. but they could probably add some to one of their containers. And then once they have, and let's say they order a pallet or two pallets to get started and boom, it goes. Yeah. Well, then you upset the entire market by being sold out for three months while you wait for more to get here. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying for anybody trying to be upstart, you have to have something here in the U.S. just to make sure your business doesn't go, Yeah. you know. So um, I think, uh, you know, you, you guys import a lot, so it would be great for a supplier to be upfront saying, okay, you know, this is a pallet price and I'll use MSW or Park Street for the first year to, to together build this brand. Exactly. The moment you can do direct container, it's straight 10% discount or whatever, 15% discount, right? Yeah. So you already know uh, that ultimately even that will be a nice margin once you start a full container yourself? Yeah, yeah I would say um, the direct import model should have uh, a financial incentive for the importer slash wholesaler to bear that inventory burden. Agree, agree. Um, because especially if it's something where, you know, we talked about data and we know these these things that are working, but if us as, as an importer and wholesaler are taking a chance on a new project, yep. we we took the chance, yeah. we, we believe it's going to go well. Mm. Um, but again, the market's always going to be the one who ultimately tells us it. how so, it's going to go. So I think that's one uh, which I, I personally believe that giving pickup location and small loads as a convenience is much better than talking about product more and more, right? So what other yeah. things you think uh, suppliers can pitch uh, in, in that uh, when they're approaching you? Uh, what about terms? Like, how are you guys, what do you advise? Like 30 days, 60 days, or? It, it, it's variable. I, use, I would say industry standard for anything domestic is 30 days. Okay. Um, international can be a little more tricky, and really everyone works differently, and we sort of feel the right wholesaler should be flexible to work how the supplier likes to work. Um, so we, I work with some suppliers who... So that's not a breaking decision? Like if someone told you 30 days or 60 days, that's okay? Um, and on an inter international uh, level, it should be at least 60. Uh, okay. Because if I give someone an order, by the time it's picked up, it's going to take 60 days for it to get here from the time of its order. Mm -hmm. So I prefer to not have to pay the bill before it arrives, mm -hmm. especially in a new relationship. Okay. Um, I want to make sure everything shows up as it should before I pay the bill, because once you... Once Got that it. money's gone, how do you recoup it if, Got it. if not? So in, in my first email, you know, I, I've written, let's say, pick up a location here. You can start with the palette, mix and mash layers, fine end, you know, give us a chance. Uh, what other things you would want them to work in this partnership in just the first 12 months? Usually a heavy sampling budget, especially if this is brand okay. new to the U.S., uh, heavy sampling budget. Let's it, break that down, yeah. like 5% of the order? Uh, that would, that would, I, would be, I would consider that high. Uh, it's, Five it's, is it, good, yeah, right? So, yeah, that's very good, yeah. In industry standard, uh, we see somewhere between, somewhere between two and three okay. is usually standard for somebody that's up and running. Got it. Um, so five would be almost exactly what we would ask for for an opening order. Understood. So f that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, then what about flexibility of, uh, how, how much of this whole line pricing is, you know, if you have Merlot, Shiraz, Chardonnay, an objection in you taking a, a brand 
You prefer line pricing or it's okay? I prefer line pricing if it, if it makes sense. Like if, if it's, if let's say there's, to use your example, there's four wines from a producer and it's two of them are $8 and two of them are $12, that's fine. If, if I had eight, nine, 11, that's a little a little confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make ultimately want to make everyone's job as easy as possible, mm -hmm. and that that translates to the end user as mm -hmm. well. So if I if the salesperson is pitching this to a retailer and say everything's line priced, mm -hmm. and even then you can build you know a deal into that somehow. Great. I also remember that even trucking companies and giving convenience of pickup or delivery mm -hmm. was a factor, right? So what's your experience on a supplier who's saying oh, we'll take care of the freight till your door? Here's the price. So at least you don't have to worry about one more paperwork versus you picking up at uh, Western carriers, let's say in California or New York. Hugely, I would say uh, if you were looking to enter the U.S. market and have that small amount of inventory here, uh, I would say New Jersey or California uh, would be the place to look. Um, we've worked with some people who warehouse, uh, you know, they got a better price in Connecticut or a better price in Utah. We, we've seen people work all over the place um, and that's fine. Uh, but you get out of those major shipping lanes and then it, you're adding additional costs or just headache um, or it, for us it's very important to ship everything under temperature control mm. um, because we're working with agricultural products if you know your uh, if your warehouse that you chose to sign up with is in some, some far-flung like, one-off location maybe we can't get temperature control there which is important for us it might not be important to everybody but for us that that would and be that can be a deal blower, right exactly like if it's just out somewhere in philadelphia trenton or here and there exactly and if i can't if it's august yeah and it's 100 degrees in chicago and i need to order wine i can't confidently put that so product on a hack for that what you know I, uh, what i would suggest and maybe you have some other answers is look at your key brands see where their storage locations are so, for example, if this is from Western Carrier, uh, New Jersey, you know, I would rather contact that storage location and have my inventory there because I'm already doing business of like one person, but you're doing business of 30% already with that warehouse. Exactly. So your truck is going every day and you don't mind adding my 14 cases to your thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and honestly, for New Jersey, there's it, it looks like it's just a big, long row of all there's six or seven warehouses that are all basically in the same True. industrial park. So yeah. it's, it's not... Uh, it's not like you're going. Even what about town. Uh, someone taking care of shipping versus you doing pickup? Is that a big thing, or in your decision making? Um, no, we're pretty flexible yeah, on that. Um, okay. it, it's certainly nice, like as you mentioned, to not have to worry about that. All right. And it depends a lot on where on where it's coming from. Usually, uh, if it's coming from a, a far flung place, um, they would the supplier would be better positioned. Mm. Um, if they're offering that to us, they should offer that to everyone. And I would say that should be done if they're if they're looking to save money by not warehousing in one of the major warehousing locations, mm -hmm. then they should invest in the shipping okay. uh, portion of it. Cool. Uh, let's move to other things which are important in decision making, which you can suggest us, which is like point of sale, support, market work, programming. Mm -hmm. Give us an example of what other things you look at and ask them. Um, for us, uh, because Chicago is a major market, uh, for market work, usually we want uh, producers or principals only coming to the market. Like um, owners or winemakers. Exactly, yeah. Um, generally a, a sales manager, uh, we or, want them What to about come. brand ambassador? No? Um, it, it's tricky. Generally we want the person closest to the grapes, an owner or winemaker, just because it's a major market. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it's Every day there are exactly reps and ambassadors, so you want to at least, okay, I'm finally an owner, so have, have two minutes with me. It, you yeah. use that as a, a your opening, right? Exactly. It's, it's, it's a leverage piece to say, important restaurateur, you're getting hit with all these people all the time. Understood. I'm bringing you the winemaker. I'm not bringing you the sales manager. Got it. Um, that's something we usually ask for. Okay. Um, we certainly work with plenty of brand ambassadors and yep. plenty of sales managers. Um, we try to put them to work in, in different ways, okay. um, either events or training with our sales team. Um, so you don't give them the market work part. You For market work, you have like at least the CEOs or owners or winemakers and distillers? Whenever possible. Understood. Yeah. Understood. That's a preference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then uh, support, like point of sale, do you ask them uh, to bear the cost? Point of sale, yeah. Um, there's The opportunity for retail point of sale is becoming less and less. A lot of stores in Illinois like to be uh, like to do their own merchandising, okay. uh, so they want clean stores. So you know, uh, several of the biggest customers don't let you hang shelf tags anymore. Okay. Um, if they're going to hang something, they want it on their own stuff. Got it. So what we like to do is have that information ready. All right. Um, How would you uh, prefer to have suppliers send you that information? Um, usually, honestly, usually just having it uh, having it on, on email is fine. Okay. Um, and then if they have things like case cards, shelf talkers, we Artwork. do we do want that, um, but it's much more minimal than it used Was than, than you did before. Yeah. 
So for now, just artwork files is fine. Is generally And then you fine, manage your, and then we, I'm and sure then you we must can... be having a printing little Exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, what other things, uh, like sampling we said, and, and what about advertising budgets, any social media? Is there the play as well these days? Um, in, in terms of social media, yeah, we'll, we'll um, uh, for our budget, we don't, uh, we don't assign anything for social media, um, but we do try to amplify uh, other people's stories and what they're up to mm -hmm. um, and, and connect people um, in that way. Like you said, you know, let's go in that meeting which you guys just did recently. What, was, what did you cover? Um, covered all of uh, what incentives are running in the same place. What, um, as we talked about, you know, international logistics. So sorry, just been. on that incentive. Yeah, these are not supply. Maybe there is supplier incentives, but just on yourself as well. Yeah. you have some things like okay, John, you sell 500 cases, you get two thousand dollars or whatever. Are there any yeah. other things um, from you guys? We don't. Uh, we usually uh, partner with our suppliers on their incentives. So it's all passed yeah. on. Then. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's all passed on and shared with the, with the suppliers on Got the it. individual things. So just getting everybody again on the same page. So you discuss that. Exactly. You pick product. You said these are the incentives. These are the suppliers who agreed on this kind of things. Exactly. Then. And then here's our seasonal items coming in. You know, we have uh, usually we have Drapier champagne. We have our gift packs of Drapier champagne coming okay. uh, that are going to be here next week. We have this many to sell. Um, so this is like cross sell upsell items. Exactly. Got it. Yeah. Um, um, focusing on all of those, um, what our what our shipping shipment calendar looks like. Uh, you know, we probably won't be open. Uh, you know, Friday is usually a very big delivery day for us. The day after Thanksgiving, we won't be open. So that okay. that day we won't be open. However, the so don't promise anything where we cannot exactly. deliver. The Monday after Thanksgiving, we will be open. We usually don't deliver on Mondays, but that one we will. Mm. Um, so just making sure everyone's really that everyone's on the same page because once we get into this busy season, everybody gets nuts and going in their own directions. Mm. We just want to make sure everyone comes together once before it gets started and that we're all on the same page. Mm. What about any competitions you guys run? Like top three salespeople get to go to France or whatever it is. Or like uh, usually that'll be paired with the supplier incentive. So we'll, we'll look at those things. Whether that's cash, travel, we, we run all kinds of those. Uh, mm -hmm. All kinds. Nice. And uh, any other uh, things you guys do to start your sales meetings to break the ice? Like hey, introduce or what? What? What's your favorite restaurant? Whatever it is. What, what kind of things you guys do to break the ice in your meetings? Um, you know, one of the things I, I, that I really like about what we do here in our meetings is uh, we're in an old school distributor sense, uh, everyone's numbers are up on the big board. So, that's, right. so that's usually a pretty big icebreaker of, uh, oh, nice. what everyone put up this week. Oh man, you shipped that much this week? Or, oh man, what, what, what happened? Do you have a, you know. So, so that's a weekly number a for week, a weekly yeah. meeting, you guys put yeah. it? Okay. Um, and that goes up on the big board. So that's usually pretty much, uh, that's the icebreaker. So hey guys, we're with Steve. Uh, Steve takes care of order dispatch here and Steve's gonna explain us, you know, how exactly an order comes in. And we can have a look here. I don't know if you guys can see, but this is an example of, it's going to Capital Grill, a nice, uh, steak I guess chain restaurant uh, and then they have one case just one case of this uh, red 12 pack and Steve over to you you know on how you're planning to you know where you go and what happens to that order oh so after I get the uh, order um, I simply just go to the location and this location is 703 C I simply just go over to the location I pick the order and I place it on my picker and there's a two on the pick ticket which tells me where to stage it in the warehouse um, for the drivers to load it up in their truck in the morning. Got it. So I think uh, you, you're going to put one case and then yep. it goes to the door yep. number two. Yep. And in the morning, like what time uh, the truck comes? Uh, the drivers come in at 5.30 in the morning to start loading their trucks up. So whatever is there, truck person is going to uh, load uh, in the truck and the master uh, sheet is given to a you know, all the bill of loadings are there and uh, he, yes. he, he checks uh, against as he loads, I believe. Uh, yes, that is absolutely how it works. The drivers have their delivery manifest um, with all of their invoices and they know which stops they're taking for that day. And they simply just look for their cases uh, that we stage on the floor for them and then they just load it in their truck. Okay, so uh, by tonight you have to make sure that all orders, so order cutoff is basically today, right? Correct. For yeah, correct. tomorrow's delivery. Correct. Understood. Uh, what kind of issues do you normally you know what what is what's your pain points you know <laughs> you know um we just uh run into you know some some issues um but you know red till leader there's really nothing major um, uh, maybe i can think of some i'll, I'll help you uh you know literally the, uh, the system said one case is left and there was nothing yes sometimes we <laughs> sometimes we do run into those, those right. issues 
And, um, you know, we said we just do our best to locate the product that's uh, in the warehouse. Okay. So are there, uh, sometimes you discover cases at different places? Uh, yes. You know what? Sometimes that does happen. Okay. Um, what about breakage? Does, does that happen? Uh, a little yeah. Bit, or yes. You know, breakage does, does happen on the drivers, especially on the warehouse side. You know, breakage do, does happen and we record that on the what's breakage your, what's your, Yeah, exactly. What's your documentation process for that? Um, yeah, we have a breakage sheet and we just simply just write down uh, what was broken and, uh, you know, we make sure to copy everybody that does record the breakage and it does get you know mm -hmm. build out uh, how are you you know uh, I, I know that drivers mood is so important right yes. <laughs> you know because they are the face of the retailer they're yeah. just not boom, stacking up and how are you what are you doing to make sure they're happy when they go out Oh yeah, I, I mean, listen. I mean, we do our best to make sure the drivers are happy, and we, we don't overload them with tons of cases and tons of stops. And you know, I mean, we do our best, and we got water and Gatorade for them. And I mean, we definitely just try to, you know, what's the ideal? Them. Like, you want them to just ten stops and maybe two hundred cases, or what? Yeah, I mean, simply, you know, right around 20, 25 stops, okay. and you know, 100, 150 cases total. Yeah, yeah, for total day. for the day. Uh, so like five a.m. the start. Yeah. When do you want them to be finished by? Um, you know, just whenever they get the route done. I mean, we, we you know we don't rush them. Okay. Um, we just ask them, they take their time, obviously be curious to all the other drivers that are out there, be nice to the customers, and just take their time, make sure they're not, you know, breaking anything and make sure the right product gets delivered to the right customer. Uh, when you are loading, you know, let's say 25 orders, mm -hmm. Uh, is there any route planning sheet also that goes uh, with them or do they already know just by looking at the invoices? Um, they're all pretty skilled uh, drivers. Um, you know, they, they do know how to do the routes, but me, um, Jay, and Jose, the three warehouse managers, um, we do routing at the end of the night. Um, you know, we make okay. sure that there's that the right stops are in the right area. Okay. So, so if there was a brand new driver starting tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, you would print a route sheet or something yes. like that, right? Like stop one, this is the store. And uh, yes, we do print a route sheet and, uh, you know, we do route it accordingly. But, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, the drivers have to switch it up themselves, you okay. know, or they get caught in traffic or they have to skip the stop and come back to it. You know, they, they do a good job of doing that. Sure. You've never, I think, uh, I've never asked this question ever, which is what goes in a meeting which you may be running with your staff, right? Uh, how frequently do you do Is it like once a week or every day? Like, hey guys, good morning and quick uh, little rant. You know, what do you do uh, to just make sure your, your operations are? Uh, yeah, you know, simply on the receiving side of it. I mean, I get with my guys, you know, every morning we just have a quick meeting. Hey, this is what's coming in delivery wise. Okay. You know, this is what's coming in. This is what we got to plan for. And I mean, same thing on the shipping side of it. Um, you know, we have meetings, you know, once a week. Got it. Um, what's the agenda in that usually like? Also, staff, it, like you asking someone, like, hey, what problems are you facing? And, you know, are there people issues there? Oh, oh yeah, no, I mean, there's a definitely issues. That's why we have a meeting to, you know, hey, what, do you, what issues are you guys having on the receiving side? What issues are you guys having on the shipping side of it? And, uh, you know, we definitely do best to uh, communicate with one another. What's the biggest card they can pull, uh, you know, to, to get a yes from you? Boy, um... A bunch of existing business already. <laughs> exactly. I was thinking that, yeah. So, like, I already know this 10 retailers yeah. or a chain, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it was something like that of um, just something to, to because, again, this is, it's such a cash flow intensive business at very slim margins. So, just having something to say, on your first order, we know a, a, where a little bit of this is going, so you're not going to be behind the eight I, ball I, I got it. Uh, to start. So it's like, all right, Ian, give me two pallets. I come Friday, Saturday. In seven days, I'll deplete eighty <laughs> percent to make sure, right? Sure. Something like that. Something black like and that. white. Yeah. yeah, got it. So in that meeting room, you know, this, you know, I just want to bring the truth out to the suppliers. Like more of the talk should be this, right? This kind of talk instead of the appellation or winemaker uh, history. You know, you would advise them to have a deck ready for all this kind of stuff as well, right? I, I would say because uh, any uh, any established company at this point probably has a producer in those areas that they're committed to already. So, mm. as a supplier, then what is your what's your point of differentiation? And and again, saying if I'm going to pitch this, I've, I've looked through the wholesalers' portfolio and I see. Um, Wow, you have a lot of Barolo already. Mm. I'm a Barolo producer, so how how would I? I think I want to work with this person, but how do I fit best in there? Mm. Finding that point of differentiation, I, whether it is price point programming, I'm the winemaker and come come to the market twice a year. Um, we have a library release, w whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, what what's your point of differentiation uh, to exist in this portfolio that most likely already has? whatever part of the world you're in represented. Mm. So this is the boiler room, this is where the action happens, and this is really the most important room which, you know, uh, for a wholesaler. So please come. Uh, I think this is where 
the manager sit and this is where the reps are gonna sit. Exactly, yep. So and the, this is where they, you know, what they do is they throw up their weekly numbers, so it goes in the screen and then everyone sees, you know, how everyone's tracking there. What else, Ian? What's, what happens in this room? That's it, so yeah, this is, uh, we haven't uh, been able to be in here much because of COVID, so we're just getting back in here uh, now, which is great to have the team back together mm. because so much just happens through osmosis and the reps talking to each other, especially with a book of our size. Um, sometimes one rep hearing like, oh, have you, have you had this new vintage out yet? It's yeah, incredible. Yeah. And then three of the other reps go, oh man, no, you know what, I hadn't yet. I, I've been stuck on the 2020, we, we're on the 21 now, I need to get that out. Got um, it. So it's so much of the intangible. Um, we, we can measure our business so many ways, but getting the group together, especially with the veteran sales team, getting the group together in this room is, is important for us. What are this, uh, in, in you know, five or six questions they always ask usually in the meetings that, you know, when you're talking about a new product, what they want to know? Um, what does supply look like? Meaning, uh, I make sure I don't run out of supply. Exactly. Okay. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to pitch this to a, a big important restaurant group who only reprints their menu twice a year. Got it. Is this going to be here in six months, uh, or is this a one-off that I should show my wine bar? Got it. Um, instead, um, what's coming in? What's in the, what's what's in our uh, what's in our pipeline? Uh, that's usually pretty accurate, but mm -hmm. we've gotten that question more now just because logistics have become such a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, we've had things where we thought it was, you know, we received documentation from the shipper that it's cleared port. Mm -hmm. You should have your delivery next week, and then we get a notice a week later, like actually it's still in port. Mm. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you told us last week. So um, that's been the the most common question lately is lately I guess logistics where the, where the hell is it yeah uh, of all this 4,000 products you know they have to make a choice every Monday what's in their bag mm -hmm. you know uh, do you guys tell them what to take or they can pick whatever you know on their will um, a little bit of both um, we run internal uh, uh, programs we call it core brands uh, mm -hmm. where it's our internal company focuses that are um, basically uh, not like a, not a supplier incentive. So we have supplier yeah. incentives running, but then we, we look internally and say, what are the things we know we need to do some work on that we don't need to goose with with an incentive. We just say, these are the 10 things we've defined for this quarter right. that we need to so everyone we need take, to take a, a look at. Uh, this in your bag, so everyone needs it? to take a pass on this and get, uh, and you know, we, and we put a metric behind it, say, you know, uh, on these 10 buckets, you know, as a salesperson here at the end of the quarter, you can have no zeros. Uh, All right, you need yeah. to sell this. Basically. Exactly, yeah. Mm. And then and then after that, it's very, uh, we're pretty open as to what What's an average uh, volume you expect a sales rep to move uh, in a month? Um, you know, we measure most of our business by dollars because territories are so different. What's, um, what's that, let's say? Oh, boy. Um, let's leave that part out. Let me guess. Uh, yeah. So, if it's $40,000? That's about right, yeah. Yeah, because we want somebody selling about a, about a million bucks a year, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it would be more than that. It'd so be, you're measuring yeah. them by uh, dollar sales. Yeah, basically. exactly. How do you become a likable supplier? You know, uh, like a person you personally start liking, and I think that plays an important role. Yeah, it's a people business, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, ultimately it is. I mean, we're all, uh, um, everyone's got a boss, everyone's got a job to do, but ultimately it's a people business, mm -hmm. um, which we learned immensely during COVID. I think everyone who's ever worked in Chicago came back to Chicago this year, and it's been an incredible year seeing all these people we didn't get to see for three years. Nice. But how do you become a likable supplier? Um, you, It's like any relationship. It's communication and making sure that you're on the same page, and even if you disagree, you see the you see where the other person's coming from. It, it is almost like it, it, it's... Let's There's say, so much nuance to it. Got it. it. Maybe it, this will help you. What is what does what kind of suppliers piss you off, right? Like in market where when they're trying to be friends with their sales reps or trying to do direct deals or something like that. What kind of things are a no for a supplier that you know that your trust is broken? Yeah, I mean, really uh, making deals without us involved. Um, uh, the idea that uh, that it's not really a partnership that. Um, Got you it. know, if you, if you want to come to the market seven times in a year, we would consider that a lot. Um, and what do we get out of that? You know, if, if our if our salespeople are dedicating that much time to building you up, hmm. and the market again told us maybe that we're not that excited about this, hmm. and then you're telling me in our year-end review that next time you need to come nine times because clearly the seven didn't work, um, our expectations are misaligned. Hmm. Um, I, but honestly, I think we um, we've built a network of, of people we know and trust. 
and then that's part of it. We need to be able to go to dinner with people. Mm. Um, I think uh, I think that market work would be one shot which they get to win your reputation, sales res- reputation. Yeah. You know that launch kickoff, right? Oh, for sure. Uh, and I, I think what do you advise they should do uh, just as a closing uh, in that particular market work, like your definition of exactly entering this room, mm-hmm. saying hello to you, coaching your sales rep. Just walk us over that perfect execution of a market work. We've been trying to rethink it a little bit since uh, since COVID of the idea of just getting in someone's car and seeing eight customers a day. Um, it, it's expensive to come to Chicago. So mm. if we broke it down and said it's $5,000 to come to Chicago for two or three days, mm-hmm. um, by the time you fly here and hotel stays and all of that, um, and you saw eight customers one day, eight customers the next day, and met with our sales team, that seems incredibly inefficient to me hmm. um, to spend five thousand dollars to see 14 or 15 people hmm. um, so we're trying to be smarter about how we do that um, by either booking a larger event where you can see more people mm-hmm. um, or saying you know maybe this isn't the time to come uh, hmm. maybe let's look at that five thousand dollars and say could we put together uh, how is our pricing in the market are we priced competitively should we be taking a dollar off per bottle mm-hmm. uh, instead and you can stay home and we'll write to you about all the successes we've had mm-hmm. um, uh, but that didn't answer your question your question was about uh, leaving an important impression on the team yeah like um, what do you want them to cover in your sales meetings you know what how, how what do you want to cover uh, if you and the supplier are just sitting for 10 minutes what should be the meeting agenda uh, and then the market work like how they should approach with the sales rep and the retailer yeah um, for uh, it's sort of a two-pronged if, if I'm sitting with the supplier and we're talking about you know the back of the house business that's quite different than what I want them to present to the sales team Got it. Um, one of the things we don't like them presenting to the sales team is um, here's the, the six products you work with mm. but at the winery we have oh we, we have this late harvest wine that that doesn't come to this market um, I don't and then talk have, about something which is not don't not talk relevant. about something that's, that's not talking about things that are not relevant um, we certainly want to know about the founding winemaker and important people yeah. along the way but talking about 17 people in the sales meeting room who the salespeople ultimately have no idea who those they might know who two of those 17 are but you know they don't unless your third winemaker was Robert Mondavi yeah. It, it almost doesn't matter who's the current winemaker now, who is the founder. Keeping it simple because yeah. they, they have a large agenda and a lot to keep straight. So yeah. what are my selling bullet points? That's um, right. yeah. have, you, what, have you properly equipped me with those? Um, and just distilling things down to the most simple we can yeah. uh, for them to then take to the market. What are this, uh, usually the selling bullet points like price? One uh, Price, of course. Um, uh, any sort of certifications um, okay. that they might have, where they sit uh, within a category, um, in, in terms of you know competitive set, we we talk a ton about so write a data set. like back like it's fourteen percent per year growing category or something. Exactly, like that. yeah. Uh, of, of course, if there's any kind of incentive or anything running okay. uh, at at the moment Deal. as well. Yeah. yeah, got it. Let's do some fun here. Okay. Uh, where I'm the buyer, I'm the retailer, and you're the salesperson, right? And you're carrying this uh, new brand, which is not known for the market sure. the first time you're here. So I'll throw in some objections and quickly what comes to your mind as a rebuttal, you can tell me. Sure. Yeah? I'm busy. Sure, I'll, uh, I'd be happy to come see you uh, later this afternoon when uh, when's good for you. What you got? I mean, we don't sell that category much. It's oh. a slow moving category. So right? you're one of my best customers and this is brand new to the market. I thought I would want to show it to you first before seeing anybody else is it. Tough month, you know, uh, September was slow, so we don't have budget. Sure, uh, I'm gonna have this the first week of October too. I'd be happy to send it to you then. All right, uh, let's just show me what you got. You know, uh, just be quick. Sure, uh, yeah, uh, today we've got a new producer. Uh, hasn't been in the market before, organically certified. Uh, great price point, comes in well under the competition and uh, we, we think can do great for you. Um, we've got a nice deal to start. Uh, if you, Take the three, uh, three of the wines. The uh, the fourth comes as uh, as no charge. Hmm. The wine's not bad, but it's a little expensive. Oh, that's why that free case comes in. <laughs> All right. How are you going to support me move this brand? Either myself. Uh, if you're taking a chance on the on this new line for us, uh, we're going to come in here uh, next weekend after the product delivered and, and sample out your uh, your customers to make sure it works for you. So I, I think that wine that you I took a mixed case bet on. I think that looks like it's moving. Uh, mm-hmm. What can you do? You know, if we talk about floor case stack. Sure, of course. Any single uh, any single item, we have a buy ten get one no charge. And then we have a mix and match for the whole portfolio of uh, if you take 25 cases, there's three no charge. Uh, and that you can mix up so you don't have to take 10 of any one 
one item. Who else is selling this wine? You know, I, I don't want if Beniz is selling. You know, it's it's. I don't think the production level for them is quite there yet to take it to a big retail. So uh, this is this is going to remain in the independent market for quite a while. So uh, you can be the only game in town for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw that some other people are selling at eight ninety nine. I want to sell at $7.99, you know, uh, is there any way you can sort of uh, control to make sure that they are retailing high? If they buy the deal, I can't control their margin, mm. but um, I can certainly help you to get as, as healthy as you need to be. The buyer's not there. Um, you, you should try it with me. I've, uh, the bottle's open. Why don't, why, don't we, why don't we try it and you can tell them that you think you can, uh, you can sell this, right? Ian, thanks for coming. That product that you sold me is not moving. Oh, we gotta we gotta do something about it then. Let's uh, let's get some sampling going. Um, I, I can come in and do a sampling, or we can get you uh, get some support here to uh, get you opening bottles for your customers.